Welcome everyone to the Long Island Board of Realtors presentation of Lessons Learned from Long Island Divided. Today with us, with us today is Bill Dedman. Bill Dedman is a Pulitzer and Peabody award-winning investigative reporter and best-selling author and keynote speaker. He has spoken on fair housing issues and fair lending issues Reserve, HUD, banking associations, and has done numerous presentations to realtor associations across the country, including the National Association of Realtors. Bill received the 1989 Pulitzer Prize in investigative reporting for his work at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution on the color of money, his series on racial discrimination by banks and savings and loan associations in middle income black neighborhoods. The color of money led to expanded federal laws on disclosure of loan data, new financing for middle income home buyers, and greater awareness of systemic discrimination. The articles in The Color of Money are online at powerreporting.com. 30 years later, Bill was one of four lead reporters on Newsday's undercover investigation of racial steering by real estate agents, Long Island Divided. The investigation, published in November 2019, revealed that Long Island residential real estate brokerages help reinforce racial segregation through illegal steering of customers. Newsday's team received several national awards for their work, including a Peabody Award. Long Island Divided and its 40-minute documentary film, Testing the Divide, are online at newsday.com forward slash divided. Bill also uncovered the case of the reclusive copper heiress, Uget Clark, in 2010, documenting her life in reports for NBC News. His nonfiction book, the number one New York Times bestseller, Empty Mansions, The Mysterious Life of Uget Clark and the Spending of a Great American Fortune, tells the true story of Clark and her father, the Gilded Age industrialist who founded Las Vegas. Bill is a frequent speaker for financial planning groups and charities on empty mansions and lessons learned from the Clark family's failures in estate planning. Bill has reported for the Associated Press, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Boston Globe. Welcome, Bill Dedman. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I I'm excited to have this opportunity to share with you an inside look at our Newsday team's work on fair housing. It may be surprising to you, it was certainly surprising to me, that the National Association of Realtors and local real estate associations have responded positively to a newspaper's investigation. We don't get a lot of this. I've been invited to speak about Long Island Divided to more than 100 associations in 37 states. Your association has responded in many ways to our investigation. I've seen the many training videos you've created, many guest speakers you've had, uh, your new fair housing page of resources, and I'm eager to hear Tessa's updates on the association's actions at the end of this webinar. You know, it seems that our Newsday team's tests on fair housing have sparked an important conversation, but also action with industry leaders saying what you've been saying, that these are practices that must change and soon. Let me give you a couple of examples. When the head of Realogy, America's largest real estate company, now called uh, Anywhere Real Estate, which as you know owns Cowell Banker and Century 21 and other brands. When that CEO says, we should be testing our own agents and brokers for steering and unequal treatment of customers. Well, then something has changed. When several realtor associations at the state level and some associations in large cities around the country have begun to organize programs to test their own members for unequal treatment, then change is happening quickly. And when NAR has embraced this idea of self-testing of agents, NAR says, we'll help make that happen then more change is coming. The thinking seems to be, if we don't get ahead of this policing ourselves, then we'll have more government investigations. We'll ha keep having these embarrassing media inv investigations that damage our brands. Besides, 
there's a recognition that it's the right thing to fix this. And fair housing is the law, not just in April. My goal for this session is for it to be helpful to you, but also challenging, giving you something to think about. How can unequal treatment creep into our day-to-day -day work? So we can dive into looking together at a few clips from our Newsday video of real estate agents on Long Island in action. Admittedly, perhaps not on their best days. We will focus also on best practices, steps that brokers and agents can take to increase the chances of treating everyone equally. As we go, I urge you to keep a list of specific steps that you might take, and we'll compare lists at the end. And we'll look at the changes to New York law that were based on Long Island Divided. And we can talk about some of the most difficult questions, such as what can agents say about schools? I start from this perspective. I assume that all of you want to make sure that every customer who calls or emails or walks into your office is treated fairly. Bill, you won the Pulitzer Prize for an investigation into mortgage lending practices. I thought it might be interesting for our viewers to hear a brief summary of that investigation. And how does that investigation compare with this one? Yes, Tessa, there are several connections and lessons that apply. The stories in the Atlanta newspapers that Kevin mentioned were called the color of money. You can read those online. These stories were about redlining, the practice of mortgage lenders, particularly banks, doing business on one part of the map, but not another, or accepting deposits on all parts of the map, making loans on only some parts. This was back in the late 1980s, long ago, and redlining had, had gotten a lot of attention earlier, but redlining was thought as something from the past. We found lenders in Atlanta and other cities around the country making home loans in white areas, even low-income white areas, but not in black areas, even the higher income black areas in Atlanta that were home to Coretta Scott King and the mayor and executives from Coca-Cola and Delta Airlines. Now, first lesson, the customer would have no way to know where the banks don't make loans. But we looked at how the banks operated. We found differences in where branches had been opened and closed, differences in which real estate agents the banks marketed to, even which branches would accept a loan application. Now, let me connect that to a later project for the Boston Globe in the 2000s, looking at something you'd think is very different, traffic stops in Massachusetts. Our series was called Speed Trap, and you can read it online. An interesting thing about being stopped by an officer for speeding is that we all deserve the ticket. We're all pre-qualified for the speeding ticket. But some people get a break that others didn't get. What we found was that in Massachusetts, when we looked at every traffic ticket, every warning in the state, it's pretty easy to predict who gets the ticket and who gets the warning if you know the age, sex, and race of the driver. For example, women more often got a warning especially younger women, for going the same speed. I talked with a college student. She had gotten four warnings in three weeks. Now, women, does it surprise you that this break runs out at about age 40? Minorities more often got the ticket, especially black and Latino men. Again, the customers, let's call the drivers customers, wouldn't know. Maybe even the officers wouldn't know how it breaks down. Now, three very different stories, redlining, traffic tickets, steering in real estate. A couple of lessons. First, the absence of complaints tells you nothing about whether your office is obeying the law. Bank customers, drivers on the highway, real estate customers have no way to know if someone else got a warning or if someone else got a ticket or what listings another customer got. 
So in real estate, a fix for steering can't be just to say, well, we respond forcefully to all complaints. How would anyone know to complain? Second, diversity efforts alone will not solve these problems. Diversity in hiring and promotion is useful in many ways in your business and mine, but it's not a cure-all. People often ask, well, were the minority real estate agents also discriminating? Yes, some of them were, and that's just as illegal. We found real estate agents of all backgrounds and races steering customers, just as we found police officers of different backgrounds treating minorities different from whites. We should no longer be surprised about this. Everyone has biases. Treating people differently can be illegal whether you're in their group or not in their group. It may be time to stop thinking of fair housing as a diversity issue, something nice to have, and start thinking of it, as NAR suggests, as a risk reduction issue. Third, small actions, small policies, can have a huge impact in creating and perpetuating a segregated system. For example, it seemed clear that the realtors in our test didn't have a standard for what they do and don't do with every new customer, no checklist. We saw customers come back with thick folders of information and others with skinny folders from the same agent. That seems like something you can fix. Do agents have consistent ways of qualifying customers? Asking credit scores and income of everyone or no one? Requiring pre-approval from every buyer, that's legal. Or requiring pre-approval from no buyer, that's legal. You'll help them get ready to buy a home. It's in between, as the new state law in New York recognizes. In between, where you have a policy, but some people get a break and others don't get it. That's how you end up on YouTube. I'd like to show you an introductory part of our documentary film from Long Island Divided. In this clip, one customer receives service from an agent while the same agent refuses to help another customer in the same circumstance. You don't want to go there. It's a mixed neighborhood. Mixed neighborhood. If agents are courteous and professional, how can you know that they're treating you equally compared with someone of a different race or ethnicity? I have to say it without saying it, you know. Behind smiles and handshakes, so, how do you know if they're giving you fewer options or suggesting different areas? I'm not going to send you anything more unless you don't want to store it or that rules don't apply to you and another home buyer in the same way. Long Island is one of America's most segregated suburbs. Newsday set out to discover what role real estate agents might play in keeping it that way, potentially affecting the quality of lives. Technically, as a real estate agent, you should the buyers. Oh. In house hunting, it's nearly impossible to see evidence of hidden discrimination. You would never know unless you go undercover. In one test, Johnny May Austin was the black tester, and Cindy Parry was the white tester, and they met with Anne-Marie Quilly Bichon at Signature Premier Properties office in Cold Spring Harbor. They asked for the same thing. As often happens, the agent discussed getting pre-qualified or pre-approved for a mortgage by a bank, showing how much a buyer can spend on a house. Neither had been pre-approved or pre-qualified. Here's what the agent told the black tester. So I really need that. I won't take out anyone unless I do have a pre-qualification letter. So I need to. So that means I can't pre-qualify for a mortgage. 
Oh, so that means I can't go out to see anything. I won't, I won't do it. You can try another person, but I don't have the time. And without pre-approval, here's what the agent told the white tester. Okay. Um, what is your availability? When can you start looking at houses? Um, I would say not this coming week. Cindy received 79 listings from this agent. Johnny May couldn't get any listings. Mm -hmm. And Cindy, the white tester, received two home tours. They had the same finances, the same budget, and they made the same request in the same area. But one was white, the other was black. The agent treated them differently. Now, let, let me explain why Newsday started this investigation in the beginning. As you know, Nassau and Suffolk counties have a lot of diversity overall, with people from all races and nationalities. They look like America. But minority groups, especially black homeowners, are concentrated in very few communities. Out of more than 200 communities on Long Island, a majority of the black residents live in only eight. Is that by choice? At Newsday, we had long heard from black homeowners, home buyers encountering problems when they tried to shop for a home outside of those few areas. Newsday's editor and publisher asked me to figure out how to document whether steering is still happening. Our team followed the methods used by fair housing agencies, sending out testers, with the addition of hidden cameras to record video and audio. Now about the law, that's legal in New York, and it's legal in most states. Most state laws say recording is legal if one person in a conversation knows that it's being taped. And that one person can be the home buyer, the tester. Hidden recording of audio is not legal in a dozen states. In those states, everyone has to know they're being recorded. But even there, agents are not off the hook. We can still do testing. We can interview the testers and have them write down what happened. We can monitor the texts and emails between testers and the agents. And most of all, we can see the listings that the agents give to each tester. Now, some testing is done to support a lawsuit. Other testing is done for state enforcement. The main reason we did testing is that it's the only way to know reliably what's happening. You know, our testers often came back from the real estate office to the newspaper office telling us that agent was so nice. She was so helpful. They only learned the truth, whether they were treated better or worse, when our team brought the buyers together to watch videos and to see the maps of the listings that they were given. In this next video clip, you'll meet some of our testers and also hear from a fair housing expert who works with them. And you'll meet one agent, a second generation realtor, who had a different game plan for different customers. It almost makes me wish that the racism is more explicit so that I would know about it. Too often I hear people who don't, maybe aren't as familiar with this kind of work, say, oh, well, they were just testers. But all you have to do is tell someone, which I have to do on a fairly regular basis, that you were turned down because of your race and tell them the circumstances that occurred on a particular test and you will see just how real and painful that injury is. Elmont, you know, it's, it's okay, it's good, you're very close to the city. Um, some of them are not as nice, you know, Elmont. I do remember him, he was nice, and I do remember him pointing out on the map. Oh, and he said, loved that map, yeah, I remember like he, that. <laughs> yeah, he had the map and he's like, you know. Some of these towns, in my opinion, are not necessarily the greatest, 
in terms of school district safety, you know, crime, resale. This agent with the map, he, he looked like General Patton planning the invasion of Sicily. But he had a different plan for home buyers of different races. For the whites, the plan started with don't get off the highway until you get past certain neighborhoods. This was one of the patterns that startled us was when some agents began their presentations to the buyers. These were new customers. Remember, they had just met with inappropriate comments or guidance that violates the fair housing laws. I hate to say it, but for some agents, it seemed that steering was part of the service that they were selling. Bill, can you tell us a little bit, uh, a summary of the test? Who was tested and what was the outcomes? Yes, Tessa, our uh, Newsday team focused only on home sales. In this test, we didn't look at rentals. We'd send a white home buyer and then a minority home buyer. And we'd randomly chose which tester would see the agent first, uh, Asian then white, or white then black, or Hispanic then white. The home buyers, gave the agents the same circumstances. They were first time home buyers, so selling another property was not involved. We chose testers of the same gender and age. We dressed them in the same business casual style, similar shirts for the men. I went shopping at Nordstrom for similar purses for the women, so there wouldn't be a class difference. They asked for the same geographic area, they ask for the same price range, the same number of bedrooms. They had the same number of children in the public schools. And they were prepared to give the same income and credit scores, but rarely were asked for any financial information other than mortgage pre-approval status on, on which they were the same. They weren't pre-approved. We shopped for houses at different price ranges. Now, always the same price for the two testers who were paired up together. We did tests from entry level now. On Long Island then, entry level was about $400,000. Up to a higher end, stepping up to a million, three million, seven million dollars. Now, seven million dollars won't get you Alec Baldwin's house in the Hamptons in Amagansett, but it will get you into his neighborhood but then you'd have Alec Baldwin for a neighbor. Now, how did we pick the agents? We didn't. We usually let the brokers pick which agents would be tested, though the brokers didn't know they were doing the picking. Whoever they had on the board, whoever was working desk duty, whoever was handling walk-ins or phone calls to the brokerage, that was our agent. Then we made sure that the second tester saw the same agent. Notice that we didn't have to do this. Under the law, brokers, you're expected to provide the same service to two customers, even if they see different agents. But we thought it would be a fairer test to see what would happen if the customers saw the same agent. That's an easier test. So we gave the brokers a break there, a break that the next test might not give you. We did 86 of these pairs, 86 tests at 12 companies, 12 brands. And we chose them because they were the largest on Long Island. Together, those 12 represent or have more than half of the listings in the market. And they include familiar names, Keller Williams, Cowell Banker, Century 21, Remax, as well as regional brands that are big only on Long Island. Newsday didn't feel comfortable being the referee. So we had two fair housing experts review each test for equal treatment. One you've met runs a fair housing program and has done tests for the U.S. Department of Justice and helped train our testers. And the other is the law professor from the University of Kentucky who writes the legal textbook on fair housing law. 
only if both of our referees independently threw a flag did we call a penalty on an agent. But Newsday didn't publish yet. Our team gave the agents and brokers all the details, invited them in to watch the videos, gave them time to check their records so they could respond to our findings. And we put the videos and their responses online so there was no out of context. This was not a drive-by investigation. This was a careful effort that took more than three years. Now, the results. Asian buyers were treated differently than their white counterparts 19% of the time, so two out of 10 on average. Latino buyers were treated differently than whites 39% of the time, four out of 10. And black buyers were treated differently than whites 49% of the time, five out of 10. Most of the attention has been on that high difference for black and white customers, and that makes sense in light of historic discrimination and current events. But don't lose sight of the rest. If four out of 10 Hispanic buyers or two out of 10 Asian buyers were treated differently in our tests, and we're half a century down the road from passage of the Fair Housing Act, those seem like high numbers as well. Out of 12 companies, 12 brands, only two, Daniel Gale, Sotheby's International Realty, and the Corcoran Group, only those two were the only ones to pass all of their tests. So it's fair to say that most of the national and regional real estate companies in our area were contributing to the racial segregation in Long Island's suburbs. You no doubt have already asked yourself the most important question, would the results be any different if we repeated the tests? It was interesting that no company said, well, that was a fluke. Get a fair housing agency to test us 50 times and let's see how it comes out. No one suggested that. If white and black and Latino and Asian home buyers go shopping for homes on Long Island, or Christians and Muslims and Jews, we didn't test for religion, or straight couples and gay couples and singles, or buyers with different sources of income. If they are searching for homes with the same criteria, then on Monday morning in their email, will they be receiving the same listings? That's the test. Let's discuss what sort of differences we saw. We saw different levels of service. Overall, our white testers got 50%, 5-0%, more listings than their black counterparts. We saw differences in how buyers were screened. Some agents refused to help our black or Hispanic buyers unless they signed an exclusive contract. They said, that's the policy of our brokerage. But the same agent didn't require a contract for the white buyer. And we saw steering. For example, the agents in our tests gave listings directing one out of four of our minority home buyers, one out of four, into different communities and different school districts altogether, no overlap with the areas that they gave to whites. Agents said to uh, one of the two testers, oh, you, you won't find anything for your money in that neighborhood when listings were available there in the customer's price range. Agents steered white buyers, but not minorities, around areas they portrayed as higher crime areas, even though community by community crime rates are not even available and published on Long Island. Then there were inappropriate comments by agents. Uh, making comments about the race or religion or ethnicity of people who live in an area or who have moved into an area, making comments about the schools, comments about crime or resale values as a way of encouraging or usually discouraging someone from living in those areas. That's steering, especially when the agent 
gives contrary information or leaves out that advice for the other buyers. It, it was fascinating. Minority buyers were not subjected to racist comments or inappropriate remarks. We're past the days of signs that say whites only. Now it's more subtle. Only the white buyers heard inappropriate comments. We can see them on our videos about race and its proxies, schools, crime, and resale values. Here's a video clip that spotlights this problem of inappropriate comments. Here, an agent gives conflicting advice about Freeport. Now you have a bad school district, and, and that's not good for resale value. All the school bus, see the moms that are hanging out on the corners. But you don't want to go there, it's a mixed neighborhood. Okay. We need United Nations. Okay. Because you might be more comfortable in a certain demographic area that is heavily one-way or another and it's Bayshore has two school districts, Brentwood and Bayshore. You don't want to have Brentwood school districts. You want to have Bayshore school districts. I can't say anything, but I encourage you, I want you to go there at 10 o'clock at night with your wife to buy diapers. Go to that 7-Eleven. They didn't buy there. <laughs> no, that's great. I have to say it without saying it. You know, you have the knowledge of the areas. Yes. Uh, I don't want to use the word stealing, but I try to edge. I'll use the no, word. I educated the areas. That's, that's... You know? Yeah. How are you, Russ? How hey, are you Russ. doing? Good. How are you? We're either waiting for the owner or waiting for the agent to show up. You don't want to be, I don't think you should be in the Almond. Uh, I think you should probably just be Franklin Square. And I remember um, specifically, he talked about steering. Yes, that's what he said. Um, steering, yes. Yeah. <laughs> And in the same breath, he mentioned, well, steering is bad, but this is what I'm going to do. There's something called a steering, no steering, you know, like steering. Oh, like a car or something? No, oh. like a horse, you know. It seems that some agents have gotten a message that complying with the fair housing laws is some sort of political correctness that means not saying the wrong thing or not saying the wrong thing to the wrong person who might complain about it. The comments made by the agents were so far over the line that they sort of get all the attention, right? I can't believe she said that. We may forget that they crossed the legal line when they gave different listings to different customers in different areas, even without the illegal comments. Perhaps we need more attention to steering, to differential treatment, more attention to what agents do and not just what they say. Are they giving the same listings? Are they providing equal professional service to all their customers? Bill, we've been talking about steering. Can you elaborate on how steering showed up in your tests? Yes, Gina, uh, thank you. Uh, steering can take many forms. It's sort of a catch-all term you sometimes use loosely for many kinds of behaviors. Uh, look at it this way. We've been discussing this in terms of individual buyers, but look at it neighborhood by neighborhood. Both of our testers would ask for an area within, say, half an hour commute of a certain community or, or within half an hour of, of Comac, Northport. Well, that creates an area, a circle around Northport. And that circle may include many communities and many school districts, which might vary in race and ethnicity and other characteristics. Then sometimes in the wider residential parts of that circle, listings were given only to our white buyers. So in that case, we can all see minorities were steered around those communities. 
That's what we were testing for. We also saw something else that we didn't expect and I suspect has not gotten enough attention in brokerages. I mention this because based on conversation with fair housing attorneys, I, I believe this is an area where new lawsuits under the Fair Housing Act are likely to occur. We had minority communities where no one of any race got listings. These minority areas are within the circle for both testers. That's what they asked for. There are homes for sale in the price range, but the agents didn't send those listings to either buyer. These were the communities with more than a modest amount of black population. The agents ignored those areas for everybody. And that's steering too. The agents in our tests had more than 200 opportunities, 200 circles that included listings in the eight largely black and Hispanic communities on Long Island. Out of those 200, they shared listings in those communities to anybody only 15 times. Agents recommended Beth Page, Comac, East Northport, Hopog, 80 times. And the same agents, given the same criteria, recommended Roosevelt, Uniondale, Hempstead, Brentwood, only 10 times. Usually the agents avoided or leapfrogged the minority areas for both buyers. Now, in that case, not only are the home buyers being harmed, remember, it's home buyers plural, both the minority and white home buyers are being harmed under the law by not being given full access to available homes in all communities. Who's protected by the fair housing laws? Everyone is. But also, the communities themselves are being harmed. The governments, the schools. There have been lawsuits like this under the Fair Housing Act. And here's what you may see in the next few years. Also harmed is anyone who is trying to sell a home in those areas or who owns a home and they're listing brokers. If you're a home seller, you could have a lawsuit under the Fair Housing Act against the brokerages that are routinely steering all buyers around your community. And you understand why. Fewer buyers means lower sale prices, lower commissions, lower home values, lower home equity, so less money for a homeowner's retirement or sending the grandkids to college, and less tax money for schools and parks and libraries. You might say, oh, but the two testers were being treated equally. That's not the only test. When I gave you the numbers earlier, different results in 19%, 39%, 49% of the tests, those don't include all the tests where the agents may have broken the law by steering both buyers around minority neighborhoods. This is a dangerous practice, our legal advisors say. Remember, the Fair Housing Act also protects sellers coming soon to a court near you. Now, here's a video clip with a straightforward classic example of steering, directing buyers to areas that more closely match the buyer's race. An agent tells one family, this is a man shopping for himself, his wife, and their teenager in the public schools, tells them that a community would be a good place to live, has the nicest neighbors, while the same agent warns another family, a man shopping for himself, his wife, and their teenager in the public schools, warns them that the same community is a dangerous place. Kelvin Toon is a black man in his early 50s, and he went in to meet with an agent involving a test in the Brentwood community, a community that is 80% Hispanic and black. The agent communicated to Kelvin, our black tester, that she enjoyed meeting with clients from the Brentwood area. Every time I get a new listing in Brentwood or a new client, I get so excited because they're nice people. When we sent 
Keldon's counterpart in to meet with the same agent. The white tester was actually uh, warned about Brentwood not being a nice place. The nursery room home we need to be near is is near is in Brentwood. Okay. And so we found a couple that are in Brentwood. Pretty, pretty close to each other. Okay. And it just seemed like those would be handy also for going to Do you to want visit. to give me them and I'll look into them for you? Or? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. That warning came later to the white testers saying there was concern about gang activity going on in Brentwood. <laughs> This agent wanted the white tester to know, but that information wasn't provided uh, to Kelvin, the black tester. The listings centered black tester Kelvin in Brentwood with 27 house listings. While the white tester got zero listings in Brentwood and was directed towards much whiter neighborhoods. Think about the point where this agent went astray. The text message about the gang activity, that gets our attention. That's the memorable part. But focus for a moment on the listings. Remember, both men were asking about an area that had Brentwood at its center. They asked for the same thing. The agent sent listings in Brentwood to the black family, but for the white family, she ignored Brentwood entirely. So we threw her a rope. Even when the white buyer went on a home tour and said, hey, we printed out from online some listings in Brentwood. They're closer to what we asked for. She still didn't show those houses and sent the note about gang activity. The comment is a problem, but don't lose sight of the main thing. To pass the test, all she had to do was to give both families all the listings in the areas that they ask for. Bill, do you think that the agents included in the documentary were knowingly steering? Some agents may believe that if steering was unconscious or unintentional, that it wouldn't rise to the level of a violation. Can you please address that? Gina, some agents did whisper or say out loud, I shouldn't be saying this, but I guess that's the real estate equivalent of, hey, buddy, hold my beer. Something bad is going to happen. But the first point to keep in mind is that it doesn't matter if the differential treatment is intentional or not. It doesn't matter. The Fair Housing Act and your state and county laws cover behavior, not thoughts or motives. The law is not a mind reader. It's the effect of your action, not your intent that matters. If a real estate agent is treating one person better or differently than another similarly situated person, and the difference between them is one of the seven categories in the Fair Housing Act, the agent and the broker have violated the law. To remind you, let's look at those categories for a moment. The categories of protected classes in the federal law are race, color, religion, national origin, disability, sex, and family status, such as having children or being pregnant. Well, state and county and city laws often add additional protected classes. So I want to show you quickly the protected classes for the Long Island area, and we're going to share that with you here. Um, race, color, religion, these are the national areas. Race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, and family status. Now, New York adds additional protected classes. A long list. Age, source of income, Creed, marital status, pregnancy, sexual orientation, military status, domestic violence victims, gender identity or expression. As you can see, when we did our stories for Long Island Divided, New York already had lots of protected classes on the books. We just tested in 
in one or two, race and ethnicity. And notice that New York already required training on fair housing for all agents. Think about that for a minute. Our team's audits of training classes showed that the training was weak, often pretty jokey, barely mentioned steering. But you know, those classes always included slides like this, mentioning what the protected classes were. That's always taught in these classes. Put those two thoughts for, uh, together for a moment. New York required training classes. New York had lots of protected classes. What does that tell you? Well, logically, I think it suggests that exposure to lists of protected classes did little to stop brokers and agents from steering. Clearly, brokers and agents can steer even though they've been to these classes and seen the lists of protected classes. I would also suggest that it's possible for brokers and agents to know nothing about the protected classes and not steer because they give equal professional service to everyone. Now, uh, to mention quickly, Nassau County um, adds ethnicity to the federal and state lists. Suffolk County adds uh, citizenship, alienage, and veteran status to the protected classes. Now, you'll also find that information on the Fair Housing page, which is very good, at lirealtor.com. Now, you asked Gina if agents are doing this intentionally. Although practically, intent doesn't matter. It is interesting to speculate about the motives of the agents. If you want to stop something from happening, you're in the risk reduction business. You have to consider why it's happening. We understand that bias can be explicit, can be intentional within our consciousness, but bias can also be implicit. Uh, some scientists use the term unconscious bias. Either way, they're referring it to being an automatic process, a stereotyping that we may not be aware of. But by whatever name, it means that people who want to be fair can still act in unfair ways. So we can treat people differently based on their identity, their appearance, their skin color, their hairstyle, their accent, even their name. Let me give you an example from our study. We did not flunk anyone for this. No one failed a test for this, but I think it's instructive. The agents in our tests were more likely to tell the buyer where the agent lives. More likely to say, oh, you're looking around Northport. I live in Northport. My kids went to Northport schools. More likely to divulge that information if the buyer was white. Minority buyers were less likely to get that sort of personal information from the agent. And where the realtor chooses to live is guidance for the buyer, right? One of the agents offered babysitting help to our white buyer. Uh, you're looking in this area and I have a friend who could, who could babysit for your kids. But our minority buyer had kids too. And the agent didn't even mention to her that the agent lived in that area. That, that could be a clue that implicit bias is at work, that having more affinity with one buyer than another, uh, uh, treating them differently based on that. S some real estate agents may be profiling, that is assuming, consciously or not, that the person of color can't really afford homes in the price range that's been given or can't qualify for the mortgage and will be wasting their time while accepting, without question, the same price range from a white buyer. One of the tricky things about profiling is that it's so ineffective. We hear from experts in many fields, such as law enforcement, that the real problem with profiling is that it doesn't work. Let's say uh, you want to stop school shootings from happening. Which kids play violent video games? Uh, or maybe you think a profile would be uh, dressing in a certain way. 
these are not good predictors of who will be a school shooter. As any parent understands, the profile would fit too many good kids and may miss the kid who's planning an attack. What is a better predictor? Stockpiling weapons, having grievances at school, telling other students even vaguely of plans. Don't be in the cafeteria on Thursday. Or think about religion and airport safety. Religion is not a good way to identify who's a terrorist. Police say, well, we would waste too much investigative resources on an innocent people because of what type of people they are. And we would miss people who are planning an attack based on what behaviors they're doing. Well, put that in real estate terms. You're in a commission business. You would leave money on the table if you assumed that people of color can't be good customers. Besides, as we mentioned, steering is illegal. Well, what are other possible explanations of why agents might do it? Some agents may think, consciously or not, that they'll make money faster with less effort if they sort people, if they show people homes where you'll feel comfortable. You heard an agent say that. You might feel more comfortable. But why assume that people want segregated neighborhoods? That agent had just met this white buyer. Why even assume that that buyer in the coffee shop isn't already married to someone of a different race or religion? Besides, steering is illegal. Agents could fear that appraisers or lenders may be biased, making it harder to close a sale at the purchase price. There is a lot of evidence going back for decades and right up to this year of bias in lending and appraisal. Differences that are not explained by the facts in the file. Uh, you may have seen the large study by Freddie Mac of appraisal differences and the well-publicized examples of home sellers whose appraisal went up on the second try when they removed evidence that a black person lived in the home. These subjects are getting a lot of attention from industry groups, from NAR, from HUD, from the Department of Justice. Meanwhile, the legal burden is on you to treat every customer fairly. There's a final logical explanation for steering, which is that a few agents may be doing it on purpose. I assume that's not really the common situation. There's just too much steering going on for it to be accounted for by only bad people doing it. Good people, well-meaning people, have to be doing it too. So we see that there are a few hands that have been raised. Bill's not gonna be answering questions during the presentation, but if you'd like to forward, forward them to feedback at lirealtor.com, we'll certainly answer every question that comes in. Thank you. Bill, what role did schools play in the actions of agents? Oh, time and again, uh, Gina, we would hear agents tout one school district over another. Um, some were blue ribbon, uh, others were declining. Often the same agent gave different information to different buyers. You know, uh, let's get a bit of context about schools. American school districts and schools vary by race and other characteristics of the students. So legally, directing someone to a certain school is the same as directing them to an area with higher or lower minority population, even if race isn't mentioned. It is a shock, but America's schools are more segregated now than they were in 1968, the year Congress approved the Fair Housing Act. School segregation and housing segregation, of course, are intertwined because we have school districts, and on Long Island, so many school districts. You may have heard agents say, oh, I can't talk about schools. The Fair Housing Act doesn't say that. Our legal advisors were clear on this. Agents can answer factual questions about schools. 
agents can refer customers to websites with information. The legal problem arises when the agents are picking and choosing different districts for different customers or making comments, comments about schools, test scores or demographics, comments to steer some customers toward or away from certain schools. Here's a discussion of School Smart video and you'll hear from the law professor who was an advisor on our project. Much better. In Newsday's 86 pair tests, agents often applied a laser light focus on school districts, highlighting their perceived quality when recommending places that house hunters should consider buying or avoid. Fair housing experts say touting or disparaging school districts can put agents in jeopardy because talking about school districts can be taken as a euphemism for race. There's a few districts mm. that I know I would like not, like I won't look in those towns. Oh, okay. You know, like Freeport and Baldwin and Amityville, which is part of Massapequa schools, but it's just certain parts of Massapequa. If the customer asked about the quality of the schools and the agent responded with accurate information, I think the agent would be fine. The problem with talking about differentials in schools is that at least in the last 10 or 15 years, that has been a proxy for race. They don't mention the race of the community. Good schools are available in these areas. Those areas I'd stay away from because they have poor schools. I want to ask, did you tell that to the other tester? If you're only giving that information to one tester of the two and the only difference is the race, then you provided what I call differential service. You only want, if you're in Massapequa, you only want school district 23. Okay. You don't want six in Massapequa because that takes in Amityville. You're not going to like those schools. The uh, agent writing out a list of schools helpfully sent the two testers from the real estate office back to the Newsday office with different lists. How do you discuss school quality without violating the fair housing laws? The, the clear advice from NAR and our experts is to limit your information to answering factual questions or you can refer them to factual information online from the State Department of Education, for example. But stay away from the trap of using or responding to opinions such as good schools or nice schools. These are not facts. NAR keeps trying to warn its members, saying realtors are not experts in schools. Why not? Well, first of all, remember that different people want different things in a school. Second, if you're judging what schools are best, you're probably using ratings that are built on school test scores. Write this on the blackboard 100 times. School test scores don't tell you how good a school is. School test scores tell you, as educators know, how educated are the parents who send their kids to that school. In America, education and wealth of parents is a very good predictor, not 100%, but very good predictor of their children's test scores. And in America, race is a very good predictor of the parents' education and wealth. So you see the problem. A so-called high-performing school may just be an area with wealthier, better educated parents. Those National Merit Scholars came into the third grade as National Merit Scholars. Steering parents, or steering just the white parents, 
around schools with lower test scores perpetuates segregation by income and race. It has a disparate impact on one group. So it's illegal under the fair housing laws. Awareness of this pitfall is increasing. NAR is working on this area, trying to come up with better advice for agents about schools. I suspect this is an area that will change the most in the next few years. And the rating services for schools are acknowledging the problem somewhat. Greatschools.org, which is the ranking service that's used by Realtor.com, changed its ratings a year ago, focusing more on student improvement from grade to grade in the school. That's helpful. But still today, the main ingredients in the cake tell you more about parents than they do about the quality of the schools. Our experts suggest that it might be more public spirited and keep you within the law to explain to parents that they need to do their homework. It's okay to tell customers, you know, there are fair housing laws for good reason that limit what advice any agent can give you about schools. It's okay to educate parents. Did you know that the school test scores mostly tell you how educated the parents are? They don't tell you which schools are good. It's okay to tell parents, if schools are important to you, talk with other parents, chat with the principal, go see the teachers in the programs that are important to you. You know, if they were buying a boat, if boats were important to them, they'd go look at boats. What's the reaction been like from the real estate industry and government? Yeah, thank you, Sean. Uh, well, when I go around the country, first I'm, I'm asked, what happened to the agents in these videos? Most of the agents are still practicing. We know that disciplinary hearings for agents are continuing at the state level. And, and we'll see if, if agents lose a license. Uh, at least one agent gave up her license to avoid facing the charges. And uh, we know of two agents in our tests who won their cases. The agent you saw who warned the white buyer about gang activity and didn't warn the black buyer, sent them listings in different areas. Just recently, she got to keep her license. The, the judge, the hearing officer, criticized the state for doing a shoddy investigation, not interviewing our testers, not even bringing into court the listings that the two testers were given. So we'll see what happens in the other cases and whether the state does a more thorough job. The agents and their brokers were called to testify in public before a state committee hearing. At first, only one showed up, but after subpoenas were issued, they did. Uh, one agent uh, who said, follow the school bus, see what mothers are waiting to meet the bus. She said, well, she just met for the customers to learn where the bus routes were. The most surprising part of the hearing was when the brokers all said they had reviewed the tests, watched the videos and found that nobody did anything wrong. Their position seemed to be that if steering isn't announced, if you don't say out loud, I'm now going to steer based on race, then it's not illegal. You know better, and New York's legislature knew better too. It approved changes in state law, starting with more testing. You know, New York law was already stronger than most, uh, but now it's tougher. Uh, and these changes were endorsed by the New York State Association of Realtors. Let me quickly describe those. More testing? supervised by the state attorney general's office, not the Department of State, for fair housing violations. The legislature saw that testing is key. How to pay for that testing? Adding $30 to a broker's license renewal, adding $10 for a salesperson's license renewal to pay for it. Responsibility. The new law says that associate brokers who serve as office managers have the same duty of supervision that a broker has. So you can expect in the future associate brokers to be named in state disciplinary actions. Standardized procedures. You know you have on your websites now 
that standardized procedures now have to be published for three questions. Do home buyers have to show ID? Are exclusive agreements required? And is mortgage pre-approval necessary? Either answer to those three questions is fine. You just have to have a policy, publish that policy, and apply it to everybody. Then there's some forms. Housing discrimination forms have to be given to buyers, customers at the first meaningful contact with them. A state fair housing notice has to be displayed at every open house, in every office, on every website prominently. And there's more training. New York already had more training than most states. Now there's two hours of training on implicit bias, two hours of training on cultural competency, awareness of different cultures, in addition to the three hours already required on fair housing. And there's an increased uh, uh, training requirement before licensure. Then there are fines, doubling the maximum fine to $2,000 on licensees who violate discrimination laws. Where do those fines go? To pay for more testing. Now, that's locally and that's in the state. Nationally, the reaction, uh, NAR has responded vigorously to Long Island Divided. New programs, new offices. NAR's program is called ACT. A for accountability, C for culture change, T for training. I just want to give you a couple of highlights of that. First, accountability. NAR has been working with state associations to point out where state licensing laws fail to support fair housing. Think about that. That's a national trade association making recommendations to its states for effective training requirements on fair housing and for holding licensees accountable for fair housing violations. It may surprise you that only a few states currently require fair housing education for all licensees or set a minimum number of hours. And NAR found that a quarter of the states don't expressly say that a licensee may be disciplined for fair housing violations. Also, most states keep violations secret. So NAR is urging its state members and the legislatures to fill those gaps. You know that NAR has updated its code of ethics as well to bar hate speech, even on a personal Facebook page, for example. And NAR is supporting those companies and associations that want to try self-testing. That wouldn't be public testing. But think about what an important deterrent that would be if you knew that your brokerage might be testing you. And that's a pilot program now underway for self-testing with the first companies to volunteer. Second, culture change. NAR says that changing the culture is probably the most difficult challenge. You saw that NAR's president apologized recently for the industry's, industry's role in perpetuating segregation, acknowledging that there is a long tradition in America of government and business working together to produce mortgage redlining maps, federal loans that only white veterans were eligible for, uh, blockbusting to encourage white flight, racial covenants on deeds, predatory subprime lending. And you know that today fair housing is a core component of your realtor code of ethics. You may not be old enough to know that for 50 years that same Realtor Code of Ethics prohibited selling a home in a white neighborhood to a black person. You may not recall that NAR opposed the Fair Housing Act. As NAR says, even if all these practices are in the past, their effects would carry on for generations through the differences in wealth and home equity. Now, under training, a few specific steps by NAR in response to our investigation. Many of you know that NAR has a new training tool called Fairhaven. It's a video game, a simulation, and it's really well done. You're the agent, you're the customer trying to close deals and bias can creep in. 
you know, hands-on training is the best. My son was merging in on the highway once when I said, hey, Justin, you finished your driver's ed class once. Those trucks seemed awfully close. And he said, oh, we've had the movie part of driver's ed. We, we haven't had the driving part yet. Well, Fairhaven is the driving part. It takes about an hour. It's at fairhaven.realtor. Some associations have challenged brokerages to have everyone go through the class. Some are publishing the names of every realtor who takes the course. NAR also has a new film series on brokerages that are embracing fair housing and profiting from it. That's called Being the Change. And most recently, NAR has a new course on implicit bias. It's a three hour course for CE credit about recognizing, interrupting the kinds of stereotypes that can lead to fair housing issues. It's called Bias Override. I'm a layman, but all of this seems useful. Thank you, Bill. Uh, two quick housekeeping items. Um, as was mentioned earlier, if folks have questions, we have an email address that's set up. That's feedback at lirealtor.com. Feedback, like the word, at lirealtor.com. Also, this recording will be available on lirealtor.com. If you go to the homepage, there's a link for our Wednesday webinar series, and this will be up there soon. Feel free, share it on social media, share it with your colleagues, to our brokers and office managers watching this meeting. Please, we highly encourage you to share this with your agents. This is really important information to get out there. Bill, we're not quite done with you yet. One more for you from me. Based on your investigation, what do you think are the best ways to combat racism in real estate? Well, Sean, um... Solving racism seems like a tough uh, task. Let's focus on reducing unequal treatment, especially steering. Our team of journalists often discussed how hard would it be to stop steering? Could brokers put a stop to it? Let's talk about some best practices suggested by NAR and others to ensure equal treatment. It seemed clear that many realtors in our tests were unfamiliar with minority neighborhoods. They didn't know about brand new homes by the water in Freeport. They weren't aware of new subdivisions or were based on old information or stereotypes. We also noticed that the large real estate brands had more than 200 branch offices in Long Island, but not a single office in the eight communities where most of the black residents lived. We found that those real estate brokers didn't represent many sellers. Their market share was not very high in minority communities. Smaller independent brokers had that business and they would say, we don't get many white buyers sent to us by the big companies. What we saw in our test makes me wonder if brokers make an effort to know whether steering is happening in their offices. Think about how you could do that. Brokers, do you check on which listings agents give to customers? Which neighborhoods? Which schools they selected? Do you ask what other areas matched up with the customer's actual criteria? Think about a map of what listings your agents choose for buyers and which areas they skip over. Now imagine that map in court. In our tests, the agents would have a conversation with the buyers and then you're well familiar with this. The agents would turn to the computer screen to generate listings in the MLS or in their company software. They would select a price range in communities and school districts. And if you think about it, that's the moment when steering happens. That means the records are in the computer. The computer knows how often your agents clicked not Freeport, Baldwin, Roosevelt, Uniondale, Hempstead. Brokers, you could demand that your Stratus or Colab or MLS software tell you which communities and schools your agents are choosing and which ones they skip before those records end up in court. And you might ask, why is the search screen on your software designed to have you picking one or two neighborhoods or schools? Does your training cover when someone says, I want to be within 40 minutes of, uh, of uh, Penn Station? 
how do you even choose that on your screen? It was noticeable that very few of the agents that we tested gave both buyers all of what they asked for, which would be all the homes within a certain circle around a center point. Let me give the law professor Bob Schwem from Kentucky, one of our advisors, a quick word on this in a short video clip. Now careful, he really steps up to the plate and takes a swing. I'm a law professor at the University of Kentucky and I've been a law professor for a long number of years. All we're asking in these tests you get two people who come in and ask for exactly the same thing. Why don't you give them the same listing? Why don't you uh, pre-qualify them in exactly the same way? It's not that big a burden. This is a law. This should be treated like a tax law or any other law. Uh, you have to obey this law, and particularly if you're in a licensed business like real estate agents. Uh, you, if you can't obey the law, you ought to just get out. Now, the complication is, I assume, that you all want to obey the law. Remember, differences in treatment could be intentional, but they're more likely to be unintentional based on a loose process that allows people to act on stereotypes or ignorance. That's what people mean by systemic discrimination. It's not an individual bad actor, but a system of policies and practices that allow different treatment. Now, I'm going to try one more time to share a screen. Let's look quickly at some suggested best practices from NAR on avoiding unequal treatment. I think you can see these slides now. We can. Oh, it's a wonderful day. Um, just some introduction first about, about the work in our team's testing. These are some of our testers. Um, I see a university professor, an IRS worker, a, a nurse, a retiree. Oh, and some uh, uh, actors, because there's a lot of actors in the New York area. Now, some best practices suggested by NAR and other local associations. I'm not an attorney, this is not legal advice, but here are some suggestions. Every customer should receive the same behavior from you. Show no more interest in one customer than another. Offer, if you offer hospitality, a refreshment, a warm greeting, offer it to everybody. You might be on camera. Follow up with every customer in the same way. If you lose track with customers, does your brokerage reach out to find out why? Use checklists. You know, checklists are useful in surgery and landing an airplane to make sure that no step is missed. Consistency and systematic procedures are key to fairness. Have the same procedure for assigning customers to agents, not based on their appearance. Explain your services in the same way. Obtain the same initial information from everyone. Explain your commitment to fair housing laws. Offer the same services and referrals. Every customer who's a buyer or a seller should leave your office with the same information in hand and keep good records of these contacts with customers. Develop standard answers or scripts for your brokerage on the difficult questions such as what schools are good. Convey the same helpful information within the law to each customer. Use templates or drafts of emails and texts for your brokerage to communicate with customers to ensure that you provide the same information. You can have a template for answering a buyer's inquiry, a seller's inquiry, for the offer process, etc. Talk about the property, not about the people. Identify objective information about what the customer wants. Talk about the type of housing available, market trends, not the populations. Provide complete and accurate information, the same to everyone. And don't suggest that buyers drive around the neighborhood to watch the mothers waiting 
for the school bus. Stick to factual information, not opinion. The reputation of a community is not a fact. Safe is not a fact. Declining schools is not a fact. Refer customers to primary sources of information. Be the source of the source. If they ask about crime, refer them to the police department. If they ask about schools, urge them to visit schools or to look on the State Department of Education website. Qualify customers in the same way as the state now requires. If you require a buyer agreement, require it of everyone. If you ask one customer for ID, ask everyone. If you require mortgage approval, apply the same requirement with the same number of days to submit that pre-approval for everyone. Offer the same referrals to everyone. Give all potential buyers all the listings that fit their objective criteria and allow the customer to make all the choices about features of the housing and price and communities and schools. Don't substitute your judgment for theirs. When the customer adds more criteria, oh, they want a primary bedroom on the main level, they want a room for a pool or a certain school district, well, then the customer will get fewer listings. Remember, you have an obligation not to discriminate against sellers and their neighborhoods. Educate buyers and owners about the law. Complete the At Home with Diversity certification. Complete the Fair Haven course. Educate sellers and owners before they can exert pressure to discriminate. Explain that that's not your thing. It's the same rules for every agent. If an owner insists on making discriminatory choices, uh, no vouchers, no children, don't bring those buyers here. You can tell them that they must find another agent. I understand you have a financial obligation to follow instructions and to work in the best interest of your client. But that obligation ends when the client's instructions are not legal. And review your advertising. Even today, there are listings on Long Island advertised today on Realtor.com as great for families in Southampton, family friendly in Great Neck, a great place to raise a family in Sayville. One of the brokerages that failed our test, the largest words on its webpage are, I help you move in the right direction. I don't think they thought that through. Combined with other evidence, would a jury see that as code? Discourage love letters or pick me letters. Usually these letters reveal information about protected classes, the buyer's family status, race, religion, national origin, age. And therefore the letters can tempt a seller or seller's agent into a fair housing violation or open them to an accusation. Sure, buyers could write a letter that includes no photographs and that doesn't disclose any information about their age, sex, family, race, religion. But have you ever seen such a letter? NAR discourages these letters. We understand that a federal court in Oregon recently blocked a state law that would have made the letters illegal. But the court suggested legal alternatives. You can advise your clients not to send love letters. Talk to your legal hotline at the state about this. Present offers with finances and terms, but not the names or characteristics of the buyers. Use a standard worksheet throughout your brokerage so that the same information is shared with every offer. And be aware that off-market listings could trigger scrutiny under the fair housing laws. Finally, NAR suggests that you use a form called the Equal Service Report. You can find this um, in the uh, broker's handbook in the Fair Housing section. I've saved it for last, but that's actually NAR's number one tip for reducing your brokerage's risk in fair housing. Keep clear records of what the customer asked for and what communities and schools and listings you gave that customer. 
That way brokers can monitor those reports and can make clear that failure to adhere to policies is grounds for counseling and, if necessary, dismissal. There's the full list. And these uh, slides we can make available to you as well. Now, I just want to give you a closing thought. Let's go back for a moment to traffic tickets, of all things. Let's say the governor puts you in charge of solving a problem. It's pretty easy to know who gets a ticket and who gets a warning for the same offense if you know the age, sex, and race of the driver. But no one would know they're being treated differently, so they wouldn't know to complain. So that's the problem, that unequal application of the law. You're being asked to solve that problem. How long would it take you to solve it? I'd say five minutes. What's the answer? Well, you could diversify your police force. That'd be good. You could have training classes. That would be good. You could put testers out on the highway. Speeding might not be so good. Or you could give everyone you pull over for speeding a speeding ticket. The problem of unequal treatment is solved by treating people equally. As the professor says, why not give them all the listings? I trust that you all want to make sure, that's why you came here, it, it, that every customer is treated fairly. The best way to stop illegal steering may be to stop steering customers at all. Stop picking their neighborhoods and their schools. And then we can move on to solving harder problems. I hope you, you will share our stories, our documentary with everyone in your office. Share it with your customers. The stories are called Long Island Divided. The 40 minute film you've seen here, about 10 minutes of it, it's called Testing the Divide. They're both at one address, newsday.com slash divided. Have a movie night, post it on Facebook, but don't stop there. Have a conversation. How does it work in our office. How can we make sure that two customers who see two different agents are treated equally? Thank you, Kevin, Gina, Sean, Tessa. Thank you for inviting me to meet with you and, and thank you to everyone who intended, uh, attended here. I, I hope this has given you something to discuss with your colleagues and with your customers. Bill, thank you so much for joining us here today and sharing this in-depth look at Newsday's Long Island Divided investigation. And thank you to all of our attendees today. Thank you for joining. I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments. Um, in 2018, the real estate industry celebrated the 50-year anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. Newsday's publication just one year later with Coast to Coast headlines made us all take a step back and re-examine what the actual state of fair housing is today. And nowhere was that more true than here at the Long Island Board of Realtors. And I want to touch on a couple of LIBOR's efforts from both before and since this report published. Education obviously plays a crucial role in training and preparing agents. So education was our first priority. LIBOR halted our fair housing classes, consulted with fair housing experts, and created a whole new menu of fair housing classes and instructors to address some of the issues raised in Newsday's publication. And we've looked for ways to engage outside of the classroom, we launched a multimedia information hub for members with an array of videos, webinars, and audiobooks on fair housing topics. We joined the National Fair Housing Alliance and multicultural real estate associations like ARIA, the Asian Real Estate Association of America, NAREP, the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals, and NAREP, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, to name just a few. We joined these groups to hear firsthand about the challenges and opportunities faced by different people in real estate. In tandem with our education efforts have been our advocacy efforts. We have launched a number of member, public, member and public awareness campaigns. After successfully passing bills in both Nassau and Suffolk to allow for the removal of restrictive covenants by property owners at no cost, we alerted members and consumers with our goodbye covenants campaign. And just last week, we launched an education campaign on New York's source of income protections that began in 2019 to ensure that all housing providers have information they need to further fair housing. If you're interested, you can find this information at home for all of us 
www.fairhousing.org. These are just a few of the ways that we have been working to make sure that all housing is fair housing. Now, would it be possible to bring back today's panelists to say thank you to everyone? Sure. Thank you. So thank you all for, for serving as panelists. Thank you, Bill, for joining us. Uh, President Kevin, did you have any comments you wanted to close us with? Yes, again, thank you all for being here today and Bill for, for that a really excellent presentation from Long Island Divided. I do want to remind the people that are that are attending today that you can send follow-up questions or comments to feedback at lirealtor.com and that you will find the recording for this session at the LI Realtor website under the education tab. Scroll down to Wednesday webinars and it'll be there shortly. So we too have learned some lessons as volunteers from Long Island Divided. And that is that we can do more, that continuing education is not enough, and that changing the culture on how we even as individuals think about fair housing is really part of our mission. So we may reach out to our members and give you that web address, that email address to, to reach out to us for what you might think is a difficult conversation. And we just think it's one that's long overdue. So keep an open mind talk with us, let us help you with fair housing, and thank you for attending today.